Well, welcome. Welcome to those of you who are logging in from various parts of the world. It is a great pleasure to um, share with you the presentation today on our regular Fourth Tuesday series at Future Generations University. Um, this particular one is a big deal for me uh, because it, in it we will share a journey that I've been involved with for about four decades. And I am thrilled especially to be sharing this with the um, really the person who did, shall I say, for the West at least, discovered the uh, origin hi hidden text. And very soon I'll be turning it over to uh, Professor Johann Reinhardt, who's we're thrilled to have on the Future Generations faculty. I also want to uh, briefly introduce uh, Elizabeth Ford, who's originally, uh, who's joined our uh, faculty team here. Elizabeth, uh, welcome to you. And um, I also hope very soon um, that uh, Wade Davis will join. He's uh, in the deepest jungles of the Himalaya, of the Amazon um, and maybe having connectivity issues. But um, I thank you everybody who's joined from different parts of the world. And um, Shannon, just spin the camera around here in the Davis World Room so that uh, folks can see the very, the turnout of, of folks here in the, on North Mountain campus with us. The session today, right, okay. The session today, um, what's, Okay, um, something's going on. I don't understand. The camera's going loud. Oh, it's, okay. The camera, the girl's going loud as well. Okay. Um, the session today, it, uh, we look at the issue of bayouls. Um, a bayoul is a Tibetan word. Uh, it means the hidden lands. And a bayul, the concept of bayul goes back centuries. And wait, and uh, Johan will be giving us a little bit of background on that um, momentarily. But as I am stepping out as the uh, president, um, and the search is finalizing now for the president to follow me at, here at Future Generations University. I'm also going to be stepping in to explore this ancient uh, legacy of bayouls. The idea of a bayoul is very timely, even though it's an ancient legacy. A bayoul is that place to which you go as the poly crisis comes on you, comes on to the new age. Uh, in ancient Tibet, they were always worried about the invading hordes from the Mongols or the other crises that would bring an end to Tibetan civilization. And so the concept of Baal was developed, the place to which you go when the end of the age is coming. And we live in a time right now that has a poly crisis of a truly global magnitude approaching. Of course, there's climate change. We are in the middle of a pandemic. We are also in the middle of growing governance dysfunction in almost every country of the world. In the last week, we've been reminded of the failures of our financial system and its fragility. We are increasingly aware of the whole advent of artificial intelligence and that a greater intelligence that is a lesser intelligence may be upon us. So we are in a poly crisis far deeper than was ever envisioned by those who first talked about Bayouls. Now, Hollywood has done a fine job of taking the idea of Bayoul and turning it into Shangri-La, a valley that you can retreat to. 
where you can escape the poly crisis. But what I want to do is to find out how the ideas of a Bayul can perhaps be at least helpful to me as an individual as I'm facing what to do with a poly crisis. I'm, that I'm facing what to do with my professional career as I step out. I want to say briefly, what do I mean by these legacy ideas? What is true and what is not true? If you take the legacy idea, for instance, of Thanksgiving, it is very much there. We celebrate it. But the origin legacy of Thanksgiving actually happened with Abraham Lincoln, who declared this as an event. And then we developed the whole idea of pilgrims and turkeys and Indians coming to the tables or whatever is in the legacy idea that you might hold. But it is Thanksgiving. Okay, it is an idea that's come forward in our current Western life in America. A similar idea, legacy idea, is the Bethlehem story of Christmas. There's fact there. You can accept part of it and not, but it, we live it, and it's become part of our culture. And so is the idea of Beuls across the Himalaya, these hidden lands to which you go in times of polycrisis and in which you can get enlightenment and understanding. Now, I first became introduced to the Bayul concept when I was following on another legacy idea, which is that of the Yeti. And we all have heard in various ways my stories about Yeti chasing and what happened on that. And I went into the Baroon, which I thought was just a jungle. And while there in the Baroon, I began to understand that I had also entered the Bayul of Kimbalung. And I became increasingly aware of this legacy of belief by the people who lived. And in the course of starting to put together the conservation projects that began with Makalu Barun and then the Kjomalungma National Nature Preserve in Tibet, we had a conference at Salima, which is in the center of the Kembalung Bayul. And I'm thrilled that a couple people here on this session online were at that Saldima Meadows conference. I think Scott and Helen McVeigh are on, Bob Davis. So you've been into the hidden lands, Scott and Bob and Helen, and maybe others who are here too, who are at that Salima conference. But those of you who've been into the Gama Valley with me have also been in to the Bayul and the hidden land of Kimbalung. So welcome everybody. I want to turn it over now to a short video clip that summarizes some of the legacies and gives you a visual of some of this. And then after that, I'm gonna turn it to Johan, who has brought with him, in fact, some of these historic manuscripts and behind me is a picture of the Kembalung Bayul. But uh, Shannon, would you please go to the short video clip now? in Kathmandu, of mysterious valleys, the holy places, the bayous, sanctuaries cut off from the cares of the world, where the faithful and their mysteries will be preserved when disaster engulfs mankind. Somewhere east of Everest lies the hidden valley of Shangri-La. James Hilton and Hollywood gave it to the West in the 30s, but the tradition is centuries older than that, and it persists. 
In Kathmandu, there's one name that people pronounce with a touch of awe, Kempaloon, the lost valley of the Guru Rupushi. Nobody in Kathmandu has actually seen it, so Kempaloon is our quest. He says that um, Guru Rupushi gave the valley to uh, the world, to save the world in time of great trouble, and that uh, it was for religious people to go to when uh, things were getting bad in the outside world for religious people, and they could go there and meditate for the salvation of the world. He says there's four ways into Kimbaloom. Yvonne yeah. Schwinard is America's best-known mountain man and a pioneer inventor of climbing gear. He's very good at it. Dr. Joe Reinhardt, also American, is an anthropologist and Yeti enthusiast. He speaks the local language, which puts him on the spot. How does the trail end? Does it just run into the river or rock face or what? Just a sheer rock face. <laughs> Well, we're here in the heart of the Gama Valley, which is one of the hidden valleys of Artemisia. It's one of the Belus, or one of these sanctuaries, created in both mystic and physical space by Guru Rinpoche when he brought the Dharma to Tibet in the ninth century. And these spaces both exist as physical refugia during times of crisis, but more importantly, they're metaphysical sanctuaries. And as Guru Rinpoche sowed these sacred valleys along the crest of the Himalaya uh, 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 as if a, 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 upon a bone of the earth itself, the skeleton of the earth itself, these became places where um, of tr tremendous spiritual significance. Uh, to, to meditate for a day in the Gama Valley was to meditate for a thousand years anywhere else in the world. To enter the valley was to enter a radiant Buddha field that, that uh, had quelled all the mountain deities and brought into being the possibility of a transcendence of the human spirit. So these valleys were, from the Buddhist perspective, this is what made it sacred. Mount Everest, Shomalungma, was never a sacred mountain. It was the environs of the flanks of Everest the path of the pilgrims that sanctified the landscape. As a giant spectrum exists in the geology, so too is the biology of the valley. The diversity of nature here can be seen through flowers. Twelve species of rhododendron ascend the valley. Tall trees with giant blossoms at the valley floor in the warm temperate zone bushes higher up in the cold temperate areas, then shrubs above the tree line in the alpine zone. Before this valley was recognized as Earth's highest, it was recognized as sacred. Here, where earth comes closest to heaven, to this place came Guru Rinpoche, to a special cave. We are walking toward his cave along the shores of a sacred lake, where if the pilgrim pauses and can look onto the still waters and sees one's own reflection, then self-understanding comes. We have followed the route around the lake and up this 800-foot climb to reach the most sacred stop on the Kimbalum pilgrimage route. What is it? What does it mean to be sacred? What is a pilgrimage? These are questions we have been asking and exploring to ourselves as we've been hiking. Regardless of one's faith, whether one believes in the mystery in the moment of the Buddhist interpretation of the sacred, Certainly the quest to find the special places of the world is a sacred quest. And certainly also it is a sacred duty 
to find the solutions that we need as people so that these special places can retain their heritage, their holiness. So this is a little visual introduction. We'll pick up uh, some more later on, but we're really lucky today to have Johan here in the Davis World Room on the North Mountain campus. We're lucky, I'm very lucky to have Johan occupy the office just below me so I can run down and talk to him at all the very well about all these interesting questions. Now, Johan, I think it was 1978, you made this extraordinary discovery of the Kembalung manuscript. So, and then you published it, uh, maybe that's 78, in the journal Kailash, and it just extraordinarily blew my mind. I've got to go there, I said to myself. And so I'm going to turn it over to you to give us a little more of the scholarly background um, while I, and I'll hold back on my passionate enthusiasm here for a moment. So welcome, Yohan. So good to have you. And over to you, and I see you've brought some, um, I see you've brought some artifacts and even a copy of the old manuscript. Thanks, Now uh, That was a nice presentation. I, uh, it was interesting to see that film. That was made in 1977. You might have guessed. It wasn't uh, just a couple of years ago when you saw, <laughs> saw me in there. Um, and the idea at the time was to go and look uh, in part for Yetis, but really with Yvonne Chouinard and some of the other British climbers, it was to get to some peaks that had never been climbed in, in an area that was very little explored. And on the way, well, we, I ended up hearing about the fa uh, a fact that uh, at the time I thought was fiction, which was that there was a hidden land called Kembalung. Um, in that area. And we thought it was kind of a, you know, just typical Shangri-La kind of story. And, but the closer you got, the more it re became real because they started telling us places we could go, things that were associated. Guru Rinpoche is this great uh, mythical quasi historical figure who brought Buddhism into Tibet, came from India. Uh, and uh, he defeated all the indigenous deities who were against Buddhism being brought to Tibet. And he's the one who, at that time, when he was talking to the king of Tibet, he was saying, well, we need to hide these texts. Uh, and we will reveal them, their guides to these different hidden lands. There's more than, there's, there, depending on who you talk to, there are a couple dozen in any event. And I've been to, what, seven or eight of them, I guess. Uh, but uh, the hidden lands, the whole concept is one that they will open at certain times with certain people under certain circumstances. It gets a bit complex, but the gist of it is, is that one of the big signs is when Buddhism is destroyed in Tibet. The, that, of course, started to happen in the 1950s when the Chinese came in, but it was also happening at the time when the Mongols came in, in the, in the end of the 1200s and early 1300s. And that's when you started getting people uh, finding these texts. The text could be actual texts like this. This is actually one to the hidden land to the east of Kembalong. It's not the Kembalong. I had just photographs of the of the text to Kembalong, but this is a published one. And uh, you had to sort of follow these during certain times and so on to get to these hidden lands where, like uh, Wade mentioned, you'll have uh, increased uh, value of your acts your prayers and so on and so forth you'll live longer it's a more prosperous place they're protector areas if you think about it all throughout the world we have these protector areas we have paradises you know there's everything from the garden of eden if you go back to uh there's hardly any culture that doesn't have some place that's meant to be a special place where you can go to in times of uh in times of strife and uh uh, so that fascinated me because I was interested in what was going on at the time. That would get to be a very long <laughs> lecture, and I'm probably going to go over 
the limit anyway here. But what I wanted to show uh, with this Tonka that's in the back here behind uh, our maestro um, is actually a Tonka of Shambhala. Now, some of you have heard that. I mean, it's a reasonably well-known concept now. It's been around for a long time in, in uh, Tibet. It's around the 10th century, 11th century that it began to be a much uh, followed and thought of, but it's a, the hidden land that was kind of the, um, what would you call it? The, the basis for the whole Shangri-La myth that was written about by James Hilton. Anyway, the gist of it is, is that you see it looks like a mandala. And these are these sacred drawings that and paintings that were used for different kinds of religious practices, particularly visual, visualization practices. Uh, but they were in India, and then they were when they brought to, to Tibet, they then started incorporating Buddhist uh, images and so forth. This shows Shambhala. The king of Shambhala is in the center. It's surrounded by these rings of mountains. The different doors, the gates are, are guarded by protector deities and so on. These protector deities were generally mountains as well, and that who got converted by Guru Rinpoche to become protectors of the Buddhist doctrine. And so all of these different hidden lands have this kind of cosmological background to them. This helps, it, it helps incredibly to diffuse these beliefs because they go to a certain kind of format that everyone who's done anything with mandalas and whether they're Hindu or Buddhist immediately recognizes. And it helps them formulate. When you look at Kembalung, when I first went there, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know it went to the Gama Valley where, where it turns out that's one of the places where it's one of the hearts of the Kembalung is supposed to be. When I was told, I was being told there were these little valleys that they were Kembalung, that they, you know, each one had kind of a claim on it. But in this case, uh, Kembalung is perceived in that way. In other words, all these have this kind of mental concept of cosmology that's from a big, the bigger Buddhist sphere in this case, applied onto the landscape, and that helps them get organized their thinking about the sacred landscape. I want to say, and this is not a obviously a prepared lecture, <laughs> but I want to say something about the sacred lands thing. What immediately struck me, and what I've seen more and more of, is how this concept of sacred land, forest, and so on, is being. It's realized that it's being used to help create. Uh, national uh, parks and reserves because most of them prohibit hunting or and so on. There are special places and there are lots of articles if you go and Google some of the stuff. There are lots of, the great Google God has got a lot of stuff about these places and uh, and you'll be interested to see how these concepts, because if the forests are part of the hidden land as well. I mean, it's not the caves, uh, the, even the avalanches have their own spirits. So uh, when you get into the thinking that's going on there, you can then see how you can incorporate it into indigenous beliefs. In other words, you can then see how you can utilize indigenous beliefs about their landscape as ways of protecting landscape through time. And that's what more and more people are doing. It's got, we've got a whole cultural sphere to protected areas now that's being much more stressed. Um, I, let's see. One other thing uh, that I think is kind of interesting is give you a concept because you'll say, wait a minute. Well, the, open, the hidden land is there. So you go in it. So what? Well, the point is, is there are different levels to the hidden land. There's the outer, the inner, and the secret. And the outer can be opened at different times. The inner is much more important. That's a part that only certain people who've gone through tantric rituals and so on are going to be able to. The secret is super important. And that's in very special times with special people that can reach into it. Therefore, what we see is just the outer, if that. You can also have the physical landscape, but it hasn't even been opened in its outer sphere. That may seem like a, a, a peculiar kind of way to look at it, and but it makes sense to a degree because these are also mental landscapes. A lot of these text revealers who are finding these texts to the hidden lands 
we're finding far more than that. Tibetan Buddhist teachings rely to a significant part, particularly in certain sects of Tibetan Buddhism, on these revealed treasures, they're called. They come into the minds of lamas and then they're written down and then they become the, the core of teaching of different sects or, or uh, different schools within different sects. Uh, and so it's these teachings that are also have their outer inner secret parts. It's one of the reasons when they were talking about bringing, you know, starting to have initiations with Westerners, bringing it to the United States, they said, that, well, wait a minute, this is dangerous stuff because you, you're only supposed to be a certain level to be able to start to understand the inner, the secret and so on. And if you bring those esoteric texts into Western civilization, they could be polluted and you know misunderstood and misused and so on and so forth. That was one of the reasons there were hesitancy amongst a lot of lamas for bringing stuff to the West. Others said, well, reality is relative. And we kind of know that because we're limited in everything we do. We're limited in our sight, our hearing, you know, whatever. We don't see things like hawks do. We don't hear things like dogs or smell things like dogs do or so on and so forth. Amazing senses that there are in our world, not to mention any other possible worlds. Uh, so we know we're limited. So when they talk about relative reality and we talk about these deities, these protector deities, at, that's at an outer level, at an inner or at a more secret level. All of that's in you. In other words, all of those wrathful deities that take on, you know, skulls and so on and so forth. That's that is something that's inside you. And you can create and uncreate, as it were, the reality because it's relative. And uh, you get deeper into reality, you get closer to it as you get deeper into being able to create and uncreate things. That's you do that through learning how to say, take a look at that tanka or any other tanka and do visualization techniques so that at the end, you don't need that tanka. You can throw it away because you can create it with your mind, every single detail. And so you get this mind control going on and that's one of the great things of Tibetan Buddhism. So, you know, so does that kind of get to where? Uh, as always, Johan, you go beyond, it's perfect. Um, Johan and I did not, we work up. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, we did We're not talking about relative reality. Yeah. Here. <laughs> we did not uh, rehearse this ahead of time, but um, the Johan made a very, very important point there, which is that the these issues we create in our minds, okay, and this today's poly crisis that I'm addressing was fundamentally created by our mindsets of individualism, our mindsets of acquisition. And these that is why we have a climate crisis. That is why we have pandemics. And the challenge now to deal with the poly crisis for me in my journey is to try to find out what for my inner self, Johan, is going to be the journey of transformation. And, you know, you've You've set me up nicely for that, but importantly, the that was the, my intention. <laughs> <laughs> More importantly, the um, the legacy of Kimball Long has set me up on that, um, and so that the point that I want to accentuate is: can we go to the slides here, um, Shannon? A few sl more slides, so people can get some visions of this Kimball Long place. The highest place on earth, the highest region on earth, which is the Mount Everest area. As Wade said in his comments, it's not so much the mountain, it's the place. This highest part of the earth is the highest calling right now for humanity. I deeply believe it. If we're going to have a sustainable future, We've got to take lessons that were developed in the region of the mountains that you see in front of us here. In the center is Mount Everest. Immediately to the left is the world's fourth highest peak. 
Immediately to the right is Choi Yu, the world's sixth highest. And then beyond on the left, you have Makalu, the fifth highest. A little bit further to the left off the off this particular image is Kachinjung of the third highest. So there in this one span, you have number one, number four, number three, number four, number five, number six, world's highest peaks. And let's take a look down into some of these magical valleys here. So here we're looking down in the Gama Valley. Everest is on the extreme right-hand corner. Then the peak with the black rock coming off just to the left is the world's fourth highest, Lotse. On the extreme left is Makalu, the fifth highest. We're smack in the middle of Kimbalung here with the reflection on this lake at 18,000, pardon me, in the foreground. And these mountains have created this hidden land, this Bayol. Next slide, please. And this is down inside the gardens of the Bayol, um, place known as the gardens. You see the same peaks again, running from Everest to Lotse to Makalu. And the, in, at the floor of, these, of this valley is the extraordinary diversity of flowers and animals and, and biology that um, we saw in some of the earlier films. Next one, please. The, the snows, this is a, one of our yak, her, uh, yak trains as we were surveying the, uh, surveying the national park. Um, it, it, you really feel like you're walking in heaven with the peaks towering above you. And it's, it's otherworldly. It's no surprise that it, people feel it's holy. It's the same feeling of holiness that we get when we walk into a religious space that is created by humans but it's to memorialize this otherness of creation. So let's keep on moving through this idea of the otherworldness of creation. And here is a map from Hildegard Deenberger's PhD dissertation. Oh no, pardon me. This is an adaptation of her map. Her map is much more complicated, <laughs> but Kembalung, there you see it. And it's straddling the border between Nepal and China. The dark black line that goes through the middle. And the Barun, you can see just under that, it goes right through the middle of the Kembalung area, the Barun River. And the Kama River up to the north and other very famous sites that are indicated on this map. So, this is the geographic representation of what you just saw in the slides that preceded pictures of these mountains. These, this is what people, the labels that people have put on to those mountains in those places. The next slide, please, Shannon. In 1985, as the Makalu Barun National Park was coming into design, we made an extraordinary decision, which was that we were going to design this national park of Makalu Barun, not in the hotels of Kathmandu, but in the center of the park itself. And so a group of 27 of us, courtesy of His Majesty's helicopter services, choppered out into the Saldima Meadow. On the right-hand side of that picture is Bob Davis, who's on this webinar. Bob, I hope you see yourself. And in the middle, in a red jacket, is Scott McVeigh. Scott and Hella, I hope you see yourself. We got you in red, roaring red. On the left is the chairman of Nepal's National Planning Commission. And immediately in front of him is the uncle of his majesty, the king. 
In the blue jacket is Tirta, Dr. Tirta Shrestha, arguably Nepal's premier ecologist. So many of us gathered in the center of this Kembalung Bayou at the Saldima Meadows. And we had began planning. And what was so extraordinary about this planning meeting is that we flipped the model of conservation from being done by scientists and led by policymakers. We flipped that model to being grounded in the experience of people, the local people, and the local people were partners. And so out of that came, the next slide, please. Out of that came in the lower right-hand portion of the, this uh, map, you can see Makalubaru National Park indicated. This was the first conservation project in Asia to be blending the advancement of people and the protection of nature, which to my view is the core message of Kimball Lung. And then from there in 1985, immediately thereafter, we went north of the border into China, an area which at that time was closed. And we began the same sort of participatory design project with the Tibetan people, and the government of the Tibet Autonomous Region. We've written about that, we photographed it, there are other webinars and slides that present the development of these national parks. But immediately as the lessons from Saldima started to unfold, they started to penetrate and go into other parts of the conservation planning, most significantly the Annapurna Conservation Project in central Nepal, which at that time was in political chaos because it, they had attempted in on ACAP to come in with a very scientific design that was led by international NGO. And they had had a rebellion from the local villagers in Gangdrung that literally had resulted in the death of a policeman and others because they were trying to impose conservation onto the people and rather and not do it in partnership. The model now has extended across the whole, much of the span of the Himalaya. It has led to the recovery of the model of participatory approach. The snow leopard, for instance, is no longer in category one on the endangered species list, but it's moved to category two. And its recovery, for instance, is a symbol of how the participatory approach between people and conservation now extends from Kazakhstan to Sichuan across the whole span of the Himalaya. And other species are recovering very nicely, such as the Himalayan black bear, which was I've been able to show is the explanation for the Yeti. We have other animals, trees, all that are recovering. It's all because we're working in partnership with people's values and people, the local people are benefiting. So let's go now back to my particular quest. Here we are in the Salima Meadows again. The bamboo hut that once had the conference chamber for those of us who gathered at the Salima conference, the bamboo hut is disappeared. The jungle is strong. Species are coming back. Future Generations has launched and established what we call a biomeridian, which is a way of monitoring nature across the span of the biology. We're looking with camera traps. We're listening with bioacoustic recorders and we're feeling with temperature loggers where the data is fed into artificial intelligence analysis. So we're starting to be able to document the fact that trees are walking uphill as the poly crisis of climate change and all the other associated variables come upon us. We're here 
in the Saldima Valley, and this is where I'm going. Just south of here, we had a very interesting discovery on these camera traps. We found a bear that should not be in the jungle here. The bear is moving from its normal habitat due to the fact that the climate is disrupted, that we're disrupted. This is not the Himalayan black bear. This is another bear whose identity I will keep secret in the secret valleys. But it's a completely different type of bear, one that you have better be careful of because it might eat you. It is a different from the Himalayan black bear, which just takes off your face. But we now have photographic evidence, thanks to the camera traps and thanks to the hard work, especially of Hari Busnet, who's also listening to this webinar. Congratulations for all the good documentation that's happening. Most importantly, this documentation is happening because we're participatory with the communities in the Barun Valley, the villagers, and all they're doing in not only advancing their lives, but in also monitoring the change that is upon us. So what are we gonna, what am I going to do here in this Saldima Valley? Well, let me tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go behind that waterfall. Because over the years of going in and out of the Saldima Valley, I become actually captivated by that waterfall. And when we went after the Salima conference, and I went and reported to His Majesty the King Burindra about our conference at Salima, he says, I've got to go there too. And so he took his chopper. He happened to be a helicopter pilot. He loved to fly. And he then, when he was starting to have marital difficulties, and some of you may have heard of marital difficulties, and you're or seen them, he, the king, had those as well. He would suggest to the queen, why don't we go out to Salima? And so they would go into the Bayul, into the, not the secret, not the inner, but the outer Bayul, and they would spend a day or two camping there to try to get enlightenment for the kingdom of Nepal under his majesty's. And I got some rather quaint and lovely stories from those times when he would come me back and say, you know, it is a very special place in all of Nepal. There is a Bayul. And it is a place of enlightenment. But let me just read to you here before I turn it open. Some of you may have questions. Let me read to you from my book, Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery the ending chapters, because if you read this book, you will see all sorts of breadcrumbs that I've scattered throughout the book about the waterfall and why I want to go behind the waterfall. And I have a pretty good idea of how to start the trail. I don't have, I'm going to now finish the trail. So I'm going to just read briefly from this book. And if you get a copy of the book, you can hear the more. How to describe a trail is also an ancient practice. It's different from go to the big maple and take a left. In the world before writing, memory was how geography was learned, shaped by combining ideas and physical features, an extension of the purpose of travel. Trails lasted in the mind through stories. So before going towards rice and lentils, I must climb in the opposite direction to answer the unknown behind the waterfall. I start pulling on and thrashing through the brush beside the waterfall. Saldima Meadow descends as I climb. My ascent appears to be through scrub rhododendron and thigh high juniper. My purpose is to look down onto the lake at sunrise tomorrow for that is when the smoke sometimes seems to rise. And I've described earlier in the book about the mystery of this lake and the smoke. 
When I awake, stars sparkle across the sky. Crisp juniper branches are at hand. It is tempting to light this still night world with a fire. But rolling up my sleeping bag and leaving all under the overhanging boulder I slept under, I select a few emergency items and at pre-dawn prepare to head towards the rim crest for my view. Stars light years above are closer than my family on the other side of the world. And the nearest settlement on this side of the world that I am sure of is three days walk through the most difficult jungle in the Himalaya. In the cold rationality of morning, I know there are no wild men in these valleys. I am alone here in the dark of night at 12,000 feet. Another message is clear for me also. For 30 years, I've been searching for a wildness that is inside me. The rock I leave has been my one night home. Making homes under overhanging rocks has been a human habit, habit for millennia, epochs, epochs longer than our staying within houses. Caves are our most familiar abode, a fact we seldom remember. Branches adorning trees are what our DNA is accustomed to seeing as living space decorations. From the black of night, a shaped world starts forming around me. As gray lightens out of the obscure, distance becomes a dimension. Depth enters a world earlier seemingly an endless unknown. The night's world knows no length, but as light joins it, space opens. It is about an hour still before the sun. Peering down over the rim, the lake is below. It must almost be a thousand feet. Small trees surround its shore, a meadow too. Mist rises from its surface. Off to the right, where a gentle slope leads to Tibet's Gama Valley, smoke rises. Smoke, not mist. Next slide, please. <coughs> a wonderful friend, a gentleman by the name of Dan, Dale Vrabeck. Some of you have had the pleasure of knowing him spent a life studying satellite imagery in a confidential way for the US government. He is now deceased, but one of his discoveries was when he was examining a early space shuttle photograph, he saw something he didn't expect on a picture taken from the space shuttle. There was a valley that he had never heard of. And Dale had studied almost everything that was to be known, studied on the Himalaya. So he decided to go and find this place. And he actually is, to the best of my knowledge, the only person, any Westerner has entered. I've talked to the Tibetan herders who regularly take their yaks in to this valley. Dale went in. And he told me it's well worth going to. It is a remarkable valley in the course of the Himalaya. So let's go to the next play, image, please. It's a remarkable valley. It's the white blotch that I have obliterated on this uh, Google Earth image. You can see Makalu on the extreme left there. So if you want to figure out where we are, that's where I'm headed, behind the waterfall. Let's turn off the camera now, please, Shannon. So, oh, Wade's here. Woo! Wade, <laughs> great. Hey, Dan, what a so thrill. Sorry. Hey, Wade, we've still got some minutes. And you uh, were introduced by a clip earlier. Um, and you are a scholar of uh, this all. So I'm going behind the waterfall, Wade. You heard all that good stuff. I hope you heard Johan describing the sacred manuscripts. And I believe you are in Colombia, deep in some exotic uh, new adventure. So Wade, let me just let leave the final minutes of this presentation so that you can share with us your understanding of Kembalong. Um, oh, Dan Daniel, I was on bated breath uh, listening to you. I'd almost rather hear you out. Uh, 
I'm so sorry. I was out early. I'm in Cartagena. I was out early doing something. I we just got back late. I'm so sorry you'd be so rude to have been jumping on this late. I um I don't know, Daniel. I think everybody's waiting on bated breath for you to tell us about that hidden valley. I mean, you're the one who introduced me to everything I know about uh Belus and and, and Johan too. I mean, your it was your work that I turned to when I wrote into the silence. And as you well know, I only ended up spending 12 years writing that book because of you. And um, that moment we stood together um, at the base of the Kanchung face in the Gama Valley and looking up from ground higher than any in Europe at two vertical miles of ice rising to the South Pole. And um, at a time when I barely knew who George Mallory was, you began to speak of these you know, Englishmen in tweeds who read Shakespeare to each other at the, in the snow at 24,000 feet. And I was Im immediately captured and that led directly to that 12-year um, that, um, effort to write that book. So I, I owe everything to you about my knowledge of Tibet. So it's hard for me to jump in here late and, 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 and usurp your time. Um, but I, 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 let me just say this, both my gratitude to you and Johan, who I think are two of my closest friends, um, and two of the men who have uh, not just taught me more, um, but inspired me more and actually physically led me to more places um, that, have, that have allowed me to grow both intellectually and in so many other ways. I mean, the only thing I have to really add about this, and, and again, I'm sure you've covered it and, and Johan would have covered it, is it just such an interesting contrast between the way Europeans embraced these mountains and how they were viewed by local people and certainly by the Buddhist tradition. And even to this day, you have a kind of imposition of the Western preconceptions on the mountains um, that, that has invoked a, a certain amount of, of, of kind of um, Buddhist um, paraphernalia and 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 practices um, out of out of sincere respect, but but nevertheless remain very much um, on the surface of things. Um, and if there's one thing the Dharma does, it looks beneath the surface of things. And and so I remember in particular um, once when with Matthew Ricard, um, we were we we had an opportunity to meet a woman who as a young girl had been very beautiful and she'd been betrothed to a, a merchant um, against her wishes because she wanted to uh, serve uh, or, or serve the Dharma. And so to escape the wedding, she literally sort of uh, fled and crawled down a human latrine and covered with excrement, uh, ended up at the Temple Che Monastery in, in Nepal, just this side of Everest. And the monks cleaned her up and dispatched her over the Nangpala Pass, again, on the flank of Everest. Um, and she became ordained as a nun and then came back over the pass and went into lifelong retreat. And according to the Tibetan Amshi doctor, who Sherabarma, who was treating her and who's with um, um, Mathieu and I at that time, she had been in lifelong retreat for 45 years. Now, obviously, she had contact with her, with her, her um, aides. She had food delivered to her. Lord knows she may have slipped out of her her, 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 her meditative cell at some point, who cares? The point is she fundamentally had committed herself to that kind of um, rather austere religious practice, which for us is almost like a, a recipe for madness. And, and yet right outside her door would trudge every day the uh, European and North American climbers en route to Everest to, to climb into a zone of oxygen deprivation so severe that it can obliterate consciousness and lead to death, which of course for the, for we may see her uh, act as an act of folly, but for the Tibetan, it is a climber who's engaged in folly. Why would anyone risk this precious incarnation, this one chance to escape samsara um, in order to climb into a zone of death on a cold bit of rock? And so for, for them, that's the ultimate folly. And that's a kind of good example of, of um, these two worlds played out in the imagination against these mountains. Um, and, and when I, we actually met that woman, 
and the door opened onto her cell for the first time and sunlight fell on her face for the first time in decades, uh, the face that greeted us was not that of a madwoman, but one who radiated loving compassion and joy. And later, Matthew said to me, you know, this is the proof of the efficacy of the Buddhist science of the mind, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And, and later on that trip, a lama said to us, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we can. And I think that that speaks to this kind of divergence of or the, 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 this uh, opposition of awareness that we the two traditions bring to the, the mountains. So, you know, to to begin to understand what these Belus mean for Tibetan it, it's not just that they're refugia in both a physical and metaphysical sense, but they literally are kind of the footsteps of Guru Rinpoche. And it's just fascinating to think back and to pay attention to the journals of those old early British uh, explorers, the 26 men who went to Everest in 21, 22, and 24, 20 of whom were um, victims uh, 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 and veterans of the absolute worst of the fighting on the Western Front. And they suddenly found themselves on this kind of mission of regeneration, flinging themselves against the highest uh, mountain in, in the world and, and, and beginning this kind of um, idea that this is some kind of sacred mountain when in fact it's more perhaps I think accurate to say as I think you taught me that it's the ground around the mountain that is sacrosanct and, and that it is in entering the hidden valley of Kenbenlun or the Belus it's when you're walking in that valley of Artemisia that you're really in sacred space. And it's funny to and fascinating to look at the journals and the accounts of these men as they describe the activities of their Tibetan companions as they crossed these passes and they made their camps and they were in the shadow of um, the cave of Guru Rinpoche and, and all of that. And it's like, you, you feel that all the Brits, it reminds you of that Bob Dylan song. You know, you, you know there's something happening here but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? You know, there's this these multiple worlds uh, happening all at once. And yet at the same time, I always sensed in the writings of those men in their own emotions to the extent that they express them or in the entire kind of unfolding drama of those three extraordinary um, expeditions where these young Englishmen who had literally gone through, you know, um, their own um, um, carnal ground, you know, it's like they'd already been through the bardo of the Western Front in ways that we cannot even imagine, and suddenly they find themselves in this in this other world, where there were on the one hand their achievements and their and their ambitions aren't even taken that seriously by the Tibetans. I mean, when when uh, Zato Rinpoche, the Lama of Rongbuk, in twenty one, he refused to break his meditative retreat even to greet them and in 22 he he basically said very simply in his namtar a few lines about the expedition basically saying i'm terribly sorry that these people uh, uh, suffered so much for such a pointless purpose you know so that you, you but at the same time you, you see the influence of on norton and on on um even finch and certainly on people like uh, Morris and and even young Sandy Irvin, you can see that this Tibetan thing, for all their cynicism and their British um, reserve, it's kind of getting through in a way. It, it makes for a very interesting um, sense of the coming together of those two worlds. And the fact the setting of it was in the sacred valleys, in the hidden valleys, in the refugia, only adds sort of um, that much more... Um, um, it makes it that much more evocative. Wait, thank you very, very much. Um, I want to give you here basically a time, but I want to give Johan, but wait, thank you. You, um, It's been such a joy to share with you, as you know, the uh, wonderful expeditions and some other people on this webinar also have shared with you, but Johan, would you like to add anything more? There may be some questions um, that have, but um, over to you, uh, First of all, hi, Wade. <laughs> hey, great you, to see you. Great to see you, brother. See you. Yeah, same here. Um, 
we got to do this more often. The, uh, I, I do want to just quickly add here is that we might be thinking that this is a ancient concept that we're dealing with ancient texts and the Baals or, you know, et cetera. The Baals and different texts that are being revealed uh, are taking place even today. In other words, you can get these mind treasures in which uh, lamas will have teachings that uh, come to them and then they pass on happening today. You can have it I went to a Bayul, uh, in, or, or rather a uh, temple that was being built in Bhutan with another new Bayul, a smaller one that was just had been revealed in the 1980s. Uh, in, 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 according to the text, these will still be happening in the future long after we're gone. You're going to be, ha they'll, they'll continue, but it's a wonderful way also on a practical level to keep renewing uh traditions and uh for example it's almost like finding a, another new gospel you find another new uh vision that you have uh that that's one of the things um yeah i better stop there how with the time <laughs> well i do want to give there's um 30 or so people that have logged in from different parts of the world um so i do want to if anybody wants to um make a question or make a comment um Shannon, they can raise their hand. You control on the panels there, and you can introduce the question from somebody, Shannon. If anybody does, we are inviting. Normally, we end these sessions on the hour. We are, um, we're going past. Um, but Dr. Rita Tapa, thank you very much, Rita. Rita was my boss in Nepal in 1968 through 71 and a dear friend, but also uh, holds the Carl Taylor Endowed Professorship here. Um, Didi, please ask your question. And unmute Mike, please. Unmute your mic, please, Rita. Well, oh, can you can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, uh, I I more than a question. I have I just want to express my extreme respect uh, to all the three speakers, uh, Daniel. You starting with you, and I have a I I really enjoyed uh, listening all of you, especially uh, Johan Reinhardt, Professor Johan Reinhardt, that uh, that the that the you know this hidden land uh, baby is in, within us. Each, each one of us have this inside us. It's the matter of how to find it because because of the poly crisis we face every day everywhere <clears throat> in, in Kathmandu now. You know the only time I feel um, I, I have this sanctuary when I go into meditation. Otherwise, you know, there are so many problems, so many, we feel like being attacked if we are especially sensitive to these things. So I really be you with the concept that uh, that Daniel so nicely explained. And be you is the concept, perhaps we could uh, actualize within ourselves, perhaps. So I have a little experience of going into meditation and finding that peace and sanctuary. So maybe that might be the concept. And I'm my hats off that to my brother, Daniel Taylor, he's taking a trip to go behind that fall. You know, I I I I I, I want to warn him. I want to rescue him. I don't know how to do it, but you know, who can stop you? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Vida, you've rescued me plenty of other ways, other times. Um, so uh, there's anybody else who would like to introduce a question uh, from the global audience or from um, or from here in the Davis World Room? Well, we are at our normal, uh, we've passed our normal uh, time. Um, and for those of us lucky enough to be here on North Mountain, there's a lovely lunch outside. Um, but I do want to give especially my deepest appreciation and thanks to uh, Johan and to Wade 
Uh, they're, they've been mentors to me and I'm looking forward, both of you young boys, to <laughs> doing some additional hiking together. Uh, you might not be with me on this trip behind the waterfall, but after I come out, let's have a good conversation and figure out where we're next gonna hike together, uh, the three of us and others among you too. And I also want to say many thanks to those of you who have been with me on other journeys into the Kembalung Bayou. Um, there are many of you uh, who logged in just now and um, I appreciate walking with each of you. And you will be walking with me as I now go for two months alone into the Kembalung Bayou. Thank you so much and goodbye. Let's just end it.